Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays of Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons. If you missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please email me. I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're so delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert faculty members of UPMC in the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Marco Capagrosso. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, to give an update on the happenings from the, the last week. Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Oh, thank you, uh, Justin. Again, I want to welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, edition. Um, what I'll do is I usually do is I'll provide a short update on the situation uh, with uh, COVID and then I'll say a few words about our speaker uh, today. Um, things uh, in uh, Pittsburgh still remain uh, fairly safe. There, we've had a small uptick in the number of uh, cases uh, within our hospitals, but again, the numbers are really, really very uh, small and minimal. We're taking all precautions necessary to make sure that everybody is uh, safe uh, within our, our hospitals. Everybody gets a questionnaire before they walk in. Everybody has their temperature checked and everybody either has their own mask or we provide them a mask while they're uh, in the hospital, limiting the number of uh, visitors. And again, number of patients is really very small. So I urge uh, anybody that uh, needs uh, care uh, certainly to contact uh, their physicians, uh, uh, feel uh, very comfortable in coming to the hospital. Uh, we're doing more and more telemedicine, again, to uh, really have to minimize the number of people uh, in the hospital. So again, I want to underscore the importance of uh, contacting your uh, doctors uh, if, uh, if needed. As we have in some of the uh, uh, prior uh, uh, episodes, um, we've talked about, uh, you know, different uh, topics. Most of them have been um, delivered by neurosurgeons. To me, it's a very, very uh, important in the culture of our department is to have neurosurgeons doing research themselves because that's how we're role models to our residents as well as to medical students to demonstrate that you know an active and busy academic neurosurgeon can do research themselves. However, in addition to that, it's incredibly important to complement what we do with people that, that do research full time uh, and are embedded within a department of neurosurgery because that's what makes it critical. Other people, basic scientists can do research in a neuroscience department or, 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 in, or in a scientific department, but really to have applied neuroscience where it's uh, where you need humans as part of uh, the, uh, the research and therapeutic uh, process being part of a department of neurosurgery is uh, incredibly uh, helpful to achieve uh, these goals. And I've always wanted to be able to recruit an individual in the field that our speaker today is uh, working on. Dr. Marco Capogrosso, really a world uh, leader and an innovator in a uh, topic called uh, spinal cord stimulation, which he will uh, talk about. It's really amazing what, what he, has done in what he is uh, doing, uh, even within his young career, uh, he's already accomplished a tremendous, and I really am so excited to see of what uh, he'll be doing. Uh, he's uh, already collaborating with a number of uh, neurosurgeons uh, within our department, including myself, uh, looking at a broad spectrum of uh, different diseases, as well as pharmaceutical companies are approaching us uh, because they want to work with us, and it's uh, really, really exciting. So, um, is is an aside of uh, just putting together the uh, COVID situation. I'll I'll tell a little personal story of uh, Marco. Uh, the COVID situation, uh, as well as uh, is where he uh, is things that, that have happened to him. Marco's family lives in uh, Italy, and as you know, uh, Italy was affected pretty significantly at the beginning of uh, the uh, pandemic, and. Marco called me uh, because he really wanted to go back uh, to Europe and be close to his family. He told me, you know, I'm leaving. I'll be back in a few weeks. <laughs> uh, but then within the whole uh, scenario, you know, there was the travel ban. And not only there was a travel ban, but, uh, you know, uh, our government uh, prevented people with the type of uh, visa that he has, which is really for experts to bring in 
uh, uh, new knowledge uh, to our country. So it took them a few months, but we still uh, had uh, Zoom meetings and uh, really advanced science. Uh, we're able to secure some fairly uh, significant uh, grants, but really just puts it into reality. But luckily, uh, Marco's back uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, that uh, I was able to recruit him and so excited uh, that you're here and uh, look forward to your presentation. So Marco, thank you for joining us and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Robert, for the super kind introduction. I'm, I'm really, really excited to be back in Pittsburgh after uh, after this time and uh, most of all to start our activities. And I just wanted to re-emphasize a little bit what um, Robert was saying on the importance of doing science within a, a, a department, which I think is important for the surgeon, but also for me as well as a PhD to keep the feet grounded on what matters uh, to patients. And in fact, um, what we uh, are going to discuss today is um, the application of neurotechnologies and in particular spinal cord stimulation uh, to restoration of movement, which is obviously a topic that immediately attracts the attention of people because uh, when we think at movement, we, we link the concept of movement to the concept of, uh, of life and, and one of the uh, probably uh, worst nightmare is to be completely paralyzed and not be able to control uh, his body. So in the last year, there has been uh, a lot of progresses in this field. So I wanted just to make the point to see uh, whether we are there yet. And, and, and with there yet, I really mean, can we go to the clinics? Like this is not just scientific demonstration in the labs, but are we ready to deliver this to our patients? So uh, before I move into the presentation, I just want to have a disclosure um, of the fact that I'm going to be showing some videos uh, of animal experiments that involve monkeys. So please, if you're uncomfortable with that, feel free to not uh, watch the videos. So first of all, I know that here it sounds uh, uh, it sounds obvious because we we work um, towards improving the life of people, but uh, especially from the point of view of, of basic sciences, it's extremely important to remind why do we do this type of research? So we need um, to understand that when we look at numbers of uh, neurological disorders that uh, uh, are all types of disorders that span uh, the spectrum of uh, uh, the uh, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, uh, we are observing uh, uh, increasing numbers of patients and costs, uh, social and economical costs that are related to that. Like these numbers are from Europe, but they reflect very, very well also the situation in the US and it was from a recent review, I just wanted to show you that even though uh, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, uh, spinal cord injury and stroke uh, affect uh, a small, let's say, per, um, amount of the population, the um, in, impacts on the economy and on the life of these people is huge because obviously the loss of motor control has effects on one personal health, um, uh, mental health, and also the one of the, care, uh, the caregivers in the family. And in fact, a few years ago in Europe, these totaled to uh, more than 45 billion euros of cost per year. And this is um, destined to increase because the number of elderly people in our uh, societies are increasing in consequence of our um, increase in economy uh, and wealth. So in fact, we know that today, um, as consequence of these, uh, of these problems, more than 5 million of people live every day with motor paralysis and, and like, 800,000 people per year, every year, has uh, have a stroke that leads to uh, some sort of uh, mobility deficits or, uh, or paralysis. So it's a very important societal and economical problem. Uh, on the other hand of the spectrum, we have basic scientists like Sylvia Arber, which is one of the most prominent motor neuroscientists in the world uh, that recently in an opinion uh, paper uh, shared something that I, I wanted to uh, to back because I, I, I think it's important. Uh, we need to uh, not forget the importance of basic science because uh, obviously if we just finance and support research that is just drug discovery or therapy discovery, um, we're basically preventing uh, us to have the tools uh, that could generate new uh, knowledge that could might lead to new therapies because sometimes these therapies stem out of lab work that were not even meant to go directly in the clinic. So 
uh, when you are a PhD in an engineering or um, clinical department, what you need to do is to really balance these two components and keep uh, promoting basic research while being aware of what's going on on the medical side and what's important for patients so that we can strive towards a common goal and synergistically get uh, these uh, results as best. So um, today uh, I'm going to focus on how we approach in the last years and how I plan to approach this problem of balancing basic science with, uh, with medicine, uh, especially in the field of paralysis. And for that, I will use the example of spinal cord injury um, because it's, it's a very well known condition. Perhaps what is not so known is that in fact, um, in the central nervous system, we have circuits in the brain, but also in the spinal cord. The spinal cord is not just cables. So when we have a lesion, what happens is that we are isolating the circuits that are located below the lesion with the brain that is located above the lesion. So what we're really doing is uh, impeding the communication between these two components of the nervous system. Uh, uh, but the circuits that are located below the lesion would actually still be able to implement movement. So what's going on is that our patients uh, become paralyzed because the brain cannot reach anymore what's located below the lesion. So uh, in the last years, uh, uh, we've been working uh, and in parallel to other groups here in the United States, uh, Los Angeles, the group of Reggie Edgerton, but especially two prominent clinical trials, one at the Mayo Clinic, and one in Louisville on the development of spinal cord stimulation to reanimate these circuits that are located below uh, the lesion. So what we observed is that um, an unprecedented capacity of this um, um, artificial way to engage these circuits in, in, instead of having natural brain connection to have uh, uh, to generate motor recovery. So you can see in this picture a person uh, this is an actual uh, set of pictures from an actual patient in one of these clinical trials that thanks to the stimulation is now able to stand up independently, almost independently uh, from the wheelchair. And uh, uh, what's going on is that uh, Reggie Edgerton, who is a scientist at UCLA that is kind of the father of this technology, uh, figured out that spinal cord stimulation uh, essentially uh, enables these circuits to use whatever is available to them for controlling movement. So because they cannot be um, uh, excited anymore by the brain, we can excite them with electrical stimulation if we properly place with a neurosurgical intervention these leads uh, below the lesion. And then the circuits are going to learn to use this input to amplify whatever is left from the system and from the sensory inputs to control and generate uh, movement. So it's an uh, extremely efficient capacity. And um, on top of that, we discovered that this is possible thanks to the fact that the epidural stimulation doesn't engage directly the muscles, so we don't bypass the circuit, but we actually stimulate the uh, sensory afferents that convey sensory information to the circuit. And so we're amplifying the input to this uh, uh, process. So there are two components to this technology um, that we discovered. One is the immediate effects. So what do I mean by that? It means the possibility to uh, implant the stimulator turn on the stimulator and on day one immediately see what is doing this uh, electrical stimulation to the ability of the patients to, to walk. So I wanted to show you one of the videos from uh, our work before joining the department where uh, we have, uh, I'm going to describe you what we see. Uh, so we have uh, a patient that is, I'm going to stop the video a little bit, so the patient is uh, uh, completely paralyzed. He is trying to uh, walk thanks to the use of a body weight support. So he has a harness that is reducing the, the weight that he has to sustain. Here you can see the muscle activity of three very important muscle for uh, hip flexion, knee extension, and ankle extension. And this is uh, just the lead, uh, the electrodes that we implant in the spinal cord uh, and how they activate the spinal circuits. So when the person after spinal cord injury tries to move over ground, uh, obviously it, it, it cannot do it. And you can see that uh, the patient is trying to pull the leg by moving the trunk, but it has absolutely no control on the leg muscles that are not activated at all. When this person just um, one minute after is uh, doing the same task, 
with uh, electrical stimulation, so supported by spinal cord stimulation, you can see that it's not only able to directly walk over ground, but even produce sustained and very important muscle activity in the legs. So without any training, this, uh, uh, this patient was able to uh, immediately uh, recover uh, some capacity uh, to walk. It is still obviously uh, aided by a body weight <coughs> support system, sorry, but uh, it, can, it can move. Um, another example here is another uh, patient. I wanted to show you how immediate uh, is um, the, the effects that uh, epidural stimulation delivers. So this patient is walking with the stimulation and then right now we are going to turn off immediately the, uh, the stimulation and the guy in consequence of the fact that the stimulation is off cannot move the leg. Then the stimulation gets turned on again and the person can immediately uh, restore motor control and movement. So it is really uh, an on and off effect that we have with the stimulator that can support uh, the execution of movement. Now, um, this was pretty cool for us to, to observe the capacity of these patients to uh, suddenly be able to move the leg. And perhaps one thing that I wanted to um, uh, show is that we're not controlling this as engineers. What we did was a skilled neurosurgical procedure where we precisely placed this electrode at the right place, and then um, uh, we optimize the stimulation parameters. But after that, it's actually the patient that is controlling the movement voluntarily. So the stimulation is enabling the patient to actually move, move over ground. Uh, if the patient wouldn't want to move, he wouldn't just start walking as some sort of puppet. So this technology is really enabling voluntary uh, motor control. And that allowed us to repeat this exercise over time uh, for months. And we wanted to understand, okay, but what happens to a patient when he starts using this system for months, for years at home, outside the lab environment? So um, here is an example of uh, one of our patients was pretty striking, where um, what you see here are the muscles of the leg and these numbers identify how much the person after the injury could actually move uh, those muscles. So you can see that the, the left leg of the subject uh, has zero scores. That means he wasn't absolutely, uh, he was absolutely unable uh, to move at all the left leg. So then after two months, with stimulation off, so here there is no stimulation going, he show us this video that he took with his own phone saying, hey guys, I think I can move my knee. And uh, we didn't uh, even believe it at this at the beginning because it looked, uh, we couldn't believe that without the stimulation this could happen. But in fact, when he sent us this video, we started wondering whether he was regaining some voluntary capacity even without stimulation. And over time, this capacity clearly improved. So you can see here how much after five months he could lift now uh, the knee and uh, and then he could uh, it started uh, having the ability to do other movement like hip flexion or even uh, single toe movement. So these things may seem very simple to us and, and, they, and they indeed are. They are not movement that change the life of these individuals, but you have to understand that uh, when you are completely paralyzed immediately after years, seeing the, the, the capacity after a few months of this treatment to see something happening to his own body is extremely exciting because nothing had happened for so long. This person had injury um, many years before the beginning of this trial and his condition was flat uh, with the classical therapy. And um, I just wanted to show you after a year, uh, that he was able to actually even take some steps completely independently uh, without uh, uh, a body weight, uh, uh, even without a body weight support. So what's happening here is that clearly we are uh, uh, discovering um, a new therapy based on the understanding of how the spinal cord, as the spinal cord circuits are organized and we're leveraging, leveraging this knowledge to, to optimize this technology. Um, there is 
yet some work to be done uh, because uh, like we were saying, okay, making few steps is probably not enough for this patient, but I believe that we are going in the right direction to be able to deliver a clinical therapy for spinal cord injury uh, within the next uh, uh, 10 years, let's say. And uh, this uh, obviously uh, is related and is going to be dependent on the successor uh, coming clinical clinical trials that are going to be executed and that actually uh, the team in Switzerland uh, led by my former uh, postdoc advisor uh, Gregoire Curtin is, is going to be focusing on uh, for the locomotion. In the meantime, what I've been doing in the last years and what I'm doing right now in Pittsburgh, it's uh, actually uh, after I saw the potential of this technology for uh, leg movement, I um, was interested in the other side of the spectrum because we know that basically spinal cord injuries, in fact, also other diseases like stroke, uh, don't not only create problems on the legs, but actually at least 50 of the patients have significant problems in controlling the arm. So that means uh, that one um, cannot move anymore his hands and arm. Uh, obviously, the uh, in daily independence is severely impacted. And so hand and arm control is another top priority for uh, paralyzed uh, individuals uh, because of the difficulties that arise from the social and professional life. And so far, um, unlike uh, locomotion, there has been a lot of research going on on trying to stimulate directly the muscles to, to produce these arm movements. Um, but uh, this type of research was really focused on creating some sort of um, engineering approach where engineers were trying to do the job of the brain to bypass completely the circuits and try to impose commands over the muscles. And here in Pittsburgh, we have some outstanding scientists that are working on extracting these commands from the brain and then try to stimulate muscles to do that. But the problem is that this is too far down the road, so we cannot develop an actual therapy with something that is so complicated and so far down the road, even though Elon Musk is accelerating this process right now. Instead, spinal cord stimulation really seemed to be simple enough to be moved to the patient right now. So I started wondering whether we could use that also to recover arm and hand movement, although arm and hand movement are extremely more complicated uh, than locomotion. And so the way uh, that I thought to do that was to step a little bit back from clinical research and go back to animal experiments because we could have used these animal experiments to understand uh, whether this was feasible and how to do it. So uh, obviously the, uh, the animal uh, of choice in this case is the monkey. And it is the monkey because uh, the, it is the only animal that has um, a biomechanical structure of the arm and the hand, but most importantly, a neural structure of the nervous system that uh, is precisely resembling uh, that of the uh, uh, human patient. So um, understanding principles of this technology in a monkey uh, would really enable us to see whether we can uh, whether we can do this also in people despite the complexity of the uh, and and arm control. So um, basically, we showed and Reggie showed that the the way stimulation is working it's it's because it's activating these powerful sensory feedbacks that, that, that are existing in the legs. But actually this feedback, and very, very similar, exists also for the upper limb. It's just that they are located in the cervical portion of the spinal cord, which is essentially uh, in your neck. So uh, here, what we wanted to do was to understand whether an animal trained to do a functional arm movement uh, that would be to basically interact with a robot that you will see after and pull the robot so that we could measure forces and muscle activity and neural data could be equipped with a new spinal cord uh, electrode located uh, in the cervical spinal cord, this time just below the lesion, uh, whether this technology could be actually used to, to improve movements. So we started by uh, investigating the anatomy of the cervical spinal cord of the uh, monkeys, uh, where you can see here uh, uh, a section of the spinal cord with the different vertebras of the neck. And uh, uh, this is between the C5 and the T1 vertebra is where most of the arm muscles are actually uh, located. So 
since we knew already um, a lot from the uh, lumbar um, spinal cord stimulation for locomotion, we translated this concept and developed uh, with our colleagues um, uh, at TPFL a soft electrode that could be inserted by neurosurgeons uh, between the uh, vertebra T2 and T1 and gently pulled uh, over the dura mater to basically en uh, um, engage the roots inside the cervical spinal cord. So this tool is, uh, is um, essentially uh, an electrode that where we could activate each of these contacts to engage specific uh, portion of the circuits that control arm and hand. Um, and uh, to do that, we actually thought that uh, today there's a there's a push towards having solutions that are personalized to each patient. So we actually um, did test this technology in three monkeys that you will see, and uh, we tailored the size of these implants uh, using CT scans, exactly as we would do in the clinics to actually create uh, the size of these implants. So this is our idea of how we should approach this also in patient, taking CT scans and MRIs and then size the implants to the specific patient to have his personal uh, uh, deficits uh, uh, resolved. So what does this stimulation uh, do? So when we uh, use this lead uh, in uh, uh, anesthetized animals, animals that are at rest after injury, we can see that we could produce single joint movement, like for example, shoulder, abduction of the arm of the monkey or extension uh, of the elbow, for instance, or another movement is, uh, say, ungrasp, for example. And for this, we were using different contacts located in different portion of the cervical spinal cord. So you, we could really reproduce the old subset and even produce sequences of movement that were pretty uh, realistic. For example, here we have a reach, um, grasp and pull movement. Uh, so that was the demonstration for us that engaging these circuits just like was happening in the leg could actually induce very powerful movements. So what we did then was a system in which we had our monkey looking at a robot and uh, uh, then the animal would imagine to actually execute the movement. Um, by reaching towards the robot, grasping the robot, and then pull and get uh, a, a juice, uh, a juice reward. Um, so, what we do is because we have brain signals recording uh, um, online, we could actually detect using the brain recordings in the motor cortex whenever the animal was about to start reaching. And according to this detection, we would stimulate a certain electrode on the uh, on the interface that would promote reach movement, then grasp, and then finally pull. So we would reproduce exactly the sequence that you saw into the videos in a live animal uh, while uh, behaving. So we performed uh, a spinal cord injury on these animals. The first animal is uh, Sansa. We named all our monkeys with uh, Game of Thrones uh, names. So she, uh, these are my students that I really cannot thank enough for having worked uh, in this project and having processed this data even during uh, COVID. Uh, we're preparing right now the manuscript for this work. But for example, in this type, in this uh, moment, the animal that we have here, it's uh, uh, it has this type of lesion of the C7 spinal segment. So it's like an section of the spinal cord. This is obviously also for ethical reason. We don't uh, reproduce in monkeys a severe injury that would impair the animal to a degree that uh, it would uh, uh, not be able to be independently uh, living uh, in his uh, home cage. So we have a milder version of the uh, of the injury that would still anyway create motor deficits that we can examine as scientists. So uh, what you will see here is that the animal uh, cannot actually uh, move um, the arm. So this is a foot treat, uh, treat that our uh, uh, animal technician is trying to push in front of the animal to push the animal to reach towards the foot treat. Uh, the animal cannot use the right arm. Uh, and you can see that despite his attempt at reaching towards the foot treat, uh, the animal cannot extend the, uh, the, the foot and, and uh, reach it. Instead, when we link the stimulation to the motor intention of the, of the animal, the animal not only reaches, but is able to manipulate the object and bring it to his mouth. This is another example of the same movement. So from complete paralysis, reaching towards the object and getting 
uh, the, the, the food reward. Um, in another example instead here, uh, this is Brienne, another animal. So uh, this is an animal that uh, we waited to test this technology because we waited for a more chronic uh, uh, spinal cord injury situation in which the animal had already recovered some of the ability, but we would still observe typical motor deficits, for example, the inability to control uh, the hand. Um, so Brienne, you can see that uh, could actually uh, reach for the object on the robot, but she was she's supposed to pull the object towards uh, towards the body, but cannot actually do it because she doesn't have any control over the hand. So instead, uh, with the stimulation, she can actually pull, grasp the, the robot and pull it back. Uh, so uh, the stimulation is not only uh, giving her the, 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 the possibility to reach, but also to manipulate and pull uh, uh, the robot uh, counteracting the minimal force that is required to actually achieve the task. So it is producing the ability to have voluntary motor control in a quite complex task that essentially involves all the arms. Uh, this other monkey video from Ygritte, I selected it because it's a little bit of a zoom of what's going on uh, with Brienne. So you can see here that uh, she would reach for the object, but she wouldn't absolutely be able to 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 move the fingers of her hand and pull at all on the interface it was just stand there because cannot uh, do uh, anything else instead when we can link again uh, the stimulation to the movement per uh, execution uh, the animal would reach then go uh, to the ball you will see now the stimulation coming in that's it. So the animal, you can clearly see that thanks to the stimulation, can really pull the robot here again and push very strongly uh, towards there. So that means that the, that the stimulation is really substantially increasing the dexterity and the force that the animal can generate. So what does that mean? That means that uh, we have a system that in a in, a, in, a, in an animal that is as complex as the monkey can produce functional, sustained and strong movements of the arm, similar to what we observe in patients. And so we think that if we could translate this to human patients and, you know, human patients are even better to work with monkeys because you can interact with them and they can tell you what's going on with the stimulation, whether you can fix it or optimize it, we can have uh, even uh, results that would resemble uh, the importance of the clinical uh, results that we saw for the locomotion. So uh, what we are doing here uh, right now at Pittsburgh, so Robert was mentioning um, some of our projects uh, that we are going to move forward. Right now here I wanted to focus on uh, uh, our current approved clinical trial, when, uh, which is open to recruitment right now, is for people that have uh, severe uh, to moderate strokes that impair completely uh, the uh, movements of one of the two arms and hand. So basically our idea is to implant the cervical stimulation just like you saw in the animals and then link uh, burst of epidural stimulation to the intention to move uh, towards the object and, and ex ex execute daily life activities. And our team is composed by Doug Weber that is uh, at CMU and Peter Gerson is a neurosurgeon in our department plus a lot of other uh, team members from uh, other departments and ours. So the idea is obviously, like I said, the stroke affect 800,000 people in the US every year. And uh, we know now in monkeys that we can do something also for the arm. So uh, we want to use stimulation uh, to treat uh, this condition right now with neurotechnologies. And our study has just been approved by the University of Pittsburgh. So we're hoping to observe the first relevant clinical effect uh, within the next years here in Pittsburgh. So with that, I think I wanted to thank a lot of people that are involved and will be involved in this research. My team uh, at Pete, Erin, Amy, Joseph and Amelia and my closer collaborators, uh, Robert, uh, Friedlander, Peter, Gersten, Doug Weber, Lee, Elvira, who happens to be my wife actually as well, and uh, Rob Gaunt and as well uh, also obviously my uh, postdoc supervisor Gregoire Cortina and my PhD supervisor Silvestro at TPFL that have taught me a lot of what I know today and uh, I hope I can uh, uh, exploit this knowledge to do even better here with this amazing team 
at Pittsburgh. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, Mark, I really some uh, uh, truly uh, spectacular uh, work. Uh, very, very proud that you're uh, part of us and so nice to see everything that's, uh, that's going on. Uh, again, just to put it into context for the people watching and uh, listening, this is almost like uh, science fiction. If you would have thought about this 10, 20 years ago, you, you would say it's impossible to really to stimulate the spinal cord and observe these kinds of uh, results as uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, I was thinking mind boggling, maybe, maybe spine boggling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> really yeah. but Mark, I have a, a question for you and I know that Justin's going to have other questions from, uh, from the audience, but out of everything that you've seen, what's surprised you the most? I think it's really this, uh, uh, well, all right, uh, perhaps the first thing that we, the first time, I didn't show it here, but the first time that we tested the stimulation before going to people was in monkeys as well for the locomotion. And and that 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 was really impressive for me. I was there with my postdoc advisor alone uh, during the experiments actually, the first time. And when I saw uh, a monkey with a spinal cord injury, and I imagine also a consequently a patient because mon monkeys and patients are, are really, really close in what the uh, type of deficit they have. Um, you know, I thought this is not working. Like like you said, it's just science fiction because, because we were working uh, on rats and mice and everything seemed cool, but you know, when you scale it up to a monkey or to a patient, you start thinking, how, how, is, how can this work? And then it actually worked. So, so I was like, I was like, wow, this is this is really something that I wasn't expecting because you know movement is so complex. Even just one movement of the leg is coordination of 39 muscles. And here, with such a simple interface, well, maybe it looks simple right now that that we know a lot, and it didn't back then. But but it was it was incredible. And the second thing that that was uh, uh, astonishing was then in people. Because in animal and in monkeys, we just tested this immediate capacity to enable movement. But I was not expecting that the use of this technology would lead to some neurological recovery. That I think is fascinating because it means that the nervous system is adapted to a technology. We're giving uh, an electrical signals and the nervous system is adapting to use this new thing that, did, that wasn't there before to do movements in a way that it wouldn't be able to. So it's it's incredible and perhaps as application even beyond clinical uh, clinical systems, right? Like uh, augmented uh, realities and sensations for people, um, and who knows uh, where uh, where it will go. But for now, we are focused on patients. Thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you, Dr. Friedlander. What an incredible presentation, truly. I'm going to go into our, our Q&A section here. If uh, anyone has a, a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A chat box or send me an email. Um, I have a number of them thus far. Uh, first one here, Doc, is many stroke patients suffer from speech impairments. Could your research and te technology be used to help them speak one day? So uh, this is uh, not, I don't think the stimulation of the spinal cord uh, would do that, but there are many groups that are using extremely similar tools to actually to actually do that. So there is definitively research going on. Uh, I know at least a couple of groups in California that are studying speech and the ability of electrical stimulation and brain computer interface to, to help with that. So the answer is uh, yes, at large but not specifically using this technology that I showed today. Thank you. Uh, how often would patients stimulation cord implant need to be changed and or maintained? Yeah, basically never. Um, I mean, we this is, you know, this is something, um, uh, this is a technology that is actually used every day. For example, in our departments, we, we have uh, a lot of implants going on because electrical stimulation of the spinal cord was uh, initially developed for the treatment of neuropathic pain. So this is pain that doesn't respond to any type of uh, pharmacological treatment. And so uh, by stimulating the spinal cord, people noticed uh, in the 70s, uh, maybe even before, there's some evidence of electrical stimulation for pain that date back 
the ancient Greece, in fact, where they were using electrical lampreys to treat pain. So that's a particularly interesting story. But anyway, these implants are developed by the major biomedical companies such as Medtronic, Boston Scientific, Abbott, and they last uh, 20 to 30 years. They are, they are meant to last forever with rechargeable stimulators. So the ideal scenario is, is one where we implant the patient and we never intervene again on the stimulator or on the battery of the stimulator. Excellent, thank you. Um, what made you choose this area of research? Yeah, that's interesting uh, because I have a background in physics. I don't know if I said, if I said that before. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I, I was, um, you know, in Europe, um, it's a little bit different than the US because um, we don't enter the PhDs right after college. We actually have to do college, then take a master and only then uh, take a PhD. So my mm, during my college studies, I was really studying theoretical physics. I was a lot into quantum mechanics and, and, and particle physics. But my, my brother is um, a medical doctor and uh, he was telling me about uh, imaging actually first. Uh, ironically enough, because actually then my wife is doing imaging. <laughs> That's how it, but um, I started uh, getting interested in medicine and application of physics in medicine, looking at uh, the cool thing that you can do now with magnetic resonance imaging or position, uh, pro, um, posi positron uh, uh, emission um, tomography. Um, and then uh, PAT basically. And then from there, um, I discovered neuroscience. And neuroscience was amazing because neuroscience feels like physics in the 20s, where Enrico Fermi was in his lab with his isotopes and doing stuff and discovering great, great things. And this is lost right now in, in physics because you need the Large Hadron Collider, which costs 14 billion dollars to actually be able to see something and do an experiment. Instead, neuroscience is so unknown. There is so vast an environment to discover things that it, it was fascinating how, how, how little we know of the brain. So, so that's how I started getting interested in neuroscience and I got in contact with my PhD supervisor that back then was working on neurotechnology to restore sensation in amputees. And I thought, uh, I mean, this is perfect because I can use my physics background to, to design electrical stimulation tools that can interact with neurons and help people and, uh, and discover how the brain works. So that, that that's how I got into this. Um, it's, um, perhaps is the, combination of fascination of uh, discoveries uh, or the unknown and the possibility to help people uh, on the line. Excellent, thank you. Um, question here, how will you go about recruiting patients for your trial? How can people help get the word out? Yeah, so uh, that's actually uh, an interesting question. So there's several uh, means uh, where uh, we are publishing, advertising the, the trial. It's actually on the website of the University of Pittsburgh, of uh, our department and uh, of uh, uh, my laboratories, as well as the University of Pittsburgh provides um, the direct resources like Pit Plus Me that reaches out to patients and that uh, patients that are uh, when they enter UPMC, they always uh, uh, can sign a consent form that um, would essentially allow them to learn about new research trials that are happening at the university. So these are our mainly uh, recruitment uh, pools right now. Excellent. So along those same lines, are you seeking funding for your work? How can an individual con contribute affect your research? Yeah, obviously we are uh, seeking always fundings um, for this research and uh, I mean um, there are several ways uh, uh, to help. Obviously one it would be to donate directly to our department where we could use these funds to support uh, directly our activities and, and you can definitely choose to uh, spell out uh, that particular project or that particular investigator, but even if you just give them to the departments 
uh, we are going to uh, use them uh, uh, as best as possible to support our research activities. And the other, uh, obviously, is to uh, get in contact with us if you know about uh, uh, initiatives uh, that are even international sometimes from non-profit organization or other donors, um, possibilities that uh, are uh, uh, providing funding in this research. Uh, uh, that would be also extremely, extremely helpful, especially if you want to connect uh, patient organization uh, with, uh, with our work. Thank you, Dr. Caparoso. Um, Dr. Capagrosa was talking about the stimulation helping people walk better who had strokes. Does this help people who have CP from a stroke? Uh, yes, so we didn't explore that possibility yet. Um, it potentially, I think so. Uh, and uh, we are trying to explore all the possible application of this technology. Like Robert was saying, we're actually even right now looking into neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so at the moment, we're really just limited by time and resources, economic resources to seek all these possibilities. So we started with uh, stroke and hemiparesis of the arm at Pittsburgh, but uh, we are going to expand into all this possibility uh, soon, as soon as we gather the resources that are necessary to, to carry out this research program. Excellent, thank you. What do you enjoy most about doing your research at the University of Pittsburgh? That's uh, another very interesting point. So because obviously research is always uh, satisfactory, but here it particularly is because of the people. So it's in an incredible environment. Um, First of all, basically, there is a world expert in anything you might think. Uh, it's 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 you wouldn't. It's unbelievable. Uh, whatever you're thinking, you know uh, that there is going to be somebody here at Pittsburgh, either at Pittsburgh, at UPMC, or at CMU, that is a world leader. There is an incredible efficacy of interaction between the clinical departments and the research department. So we have a lot of support from our clinicians. I mean. Our neurosurgeons are amazing. Like I, like, I don't. They, 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 they could, they could just focus on their clinical work, but they are really interesting in helping us. Uh, and and I've been, I've been, um, I've been really impressed by this and by their, um, by their ability to to support us. Like, like Peter Gersten is, 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 for example, that is directly working with me, uh, is helping me even on my personal life. So. It's uh, it's amazing. So so it's really the people and the spirit that Pittsburgh has, opposed to other institutions of collaboration and of uh, building a team that works towards uh, uh, realistic goals that that attracted me here, and I, and and I'm not disappointed at all. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, welcome to Pittsburgh, and thank you for your very impactful work. How have you adjusted to life in the States? <laughs> That's another interesting question. Uh, I, did, I mean, um, Pittsburgh is a nice city to live. It's an easy city to live. Uh, so far, I've been living European way. I don't even have a car, but there are uh, public transportation in Pittsburgh that uh, helped me do that. My mom came a couple of times already, so she found a couple of Italian shops that sell Italian food. That was an important point. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, I mean, uh, um, I've been in contact with the US so long and, and, and people are so open that it was really easy to, to, to adapt to the, to the American life. So I think it was just uh, smooth and natural. Glad to hear that. <laughs> what other di disciplines do you partner with at Pitt and UPMC? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, like I said, uh, one of my collaborators, uh, man, many of my collaborators, including my wife, are in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, which obviously we work a lot with because we do the intervention and then they uh, treat the long term rehab program of this patient. So it's really a collaboration between our department and them to figure out uh, uh, what's best, uh, um, what is the best therapy to deliver to, the, to deliver to this patient. So those are definitely the closer collaborations. And then uh, right there, there is people at the Department of Neurobiology, 
for obvious uh, neuroscientific reasons, we do a lot of basic research on motor control. And the other uh, uh, folks that are really important for us are uh, the guys at BioE, at bioengineering, because obviously uh, this involves a lot of technology, so electrodes development and uh, evaluation and measurement tools. Uh, for example, Doug Weber is a bioengineering, a CMU. So, so really the, the closest are, are physical medicine and rehabilitation, neurobiology and bioengineering. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Capogrosso. I'm going to throw it back to uh, Dr. Freelander. He has a question and then we'll uh, wrap it up for the day. We appreciate your time so much, Doctor, and uh, everyone who attended. Dr. Freelander, please. Uh, thank you, Justin and Mark, a really phenomenal uh, work and really you exemplify why the University of Pittsburgh is uh, really a powerhouse because of all the different collaborations and different people. I had two quick questions, one and they're related. One was about the, the long term uh, effects uh, with this in terms of from a molecular point of view or structural point of view. Why that 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 remarkable patient that you showed that uh, you know, could move uh, his knees and toes uh, even uh, months uh, uh, into the, the stimulation of a paradigm. W what do you think is happening for, for that to occur? And, and second, maybe a little bit related uh, is uh, listeners uh, probably know you know when you lose function of your spinal cord you lose motion but you also lose sensation uh, through stimulation is there any recovery of sensation by recovering some of the pathways to the brain so so these are two extremely important questions kind of linked together um we don't know yet what are the acts uh, the exact uh, molecular mechanisms that are occurring explaining that type of recovery. What we know is that there is a remodeling of the synapses uh, within the spinal cord and between um, existing synapses between the brain and the spinal cord. So what I think um, personally is happening is that um, basically our neural networks are learning to walk again as if we were kids. Uh, but uh, alone, they cannot do it. And thanks to the stimulation, they have a new tool uh, to do it. But that means that they need to change the way they are wired. So there is going to be changes as synaptic strengths that are measurable within the spinal cord uh, that explain that type of recovery. They might actually vary from patient to patient depending on which uh, descending tracts are affected or not. That's why it's extremely important to have collaborators um, like Frank here, for example, that uh, work on the uh, uh, understanding uh, with imaging uh, um, which uh, fiber tracks are exactly damaged by lesions and conditions to, to really uh, rule uh, these mechanisms out. Uh, similarly, for sensation, um, it's 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 great that we didn't really um, uh, we didn't really looked into that. Um, so there's an open avenue. Uh, it'd be interesting in people with stroke to see what's going on. Uh, I don't think that we expect regeneration of fibers across the lesion, but we do expect uh, um, a remodeling of existing synapses. So there could be strengthening of sensations uh, also in people uh, that have severe uh, sensory feedback. So this is definitely an avenue of research that we need to explore. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, obviously, very, very proud of uh, you being here. Uh, amazing uh, work uh, that you're doing for our listeners. What uh, Dr. Capogrosso was describing in the in the last uh, couple of minutes is also what's called neuroplasticity, which uh, means uh, you know re-engineering um, or reconnecting what's already there. As as we know, for the most part. Uh, it, when neurons die, they die, but if they're still there, um, it's possible for their connections to reorient themselves and redevelop something. And this has really been a, a amazing demonstration of uh, what, again, it's called neuroplasticity. Different people might have heard in the TV and different things, but yeah. this really shows it uh, really, really nicely. So thank you for, for your great uh, work and for joining us uh, uh, this week. Uh, for uh, next uh, week, I'll be introducing Dr. Uh, Miel. Dr. Miel is uh, one of our uh, spine surgeons, uh, works mostly at the Mercy Hospital. He also works uh, with the Steelers and has done uh, some uh, very exciting work on, uh, on traumatic uh, brain injury and measuring uh, uh, impact uh, forces. So I look forward to seeing you all uh, next week. Uh, have a safe and uh, 
happy weekend and we'll see you back uh, next Friday. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Marco.